candid conversations that might just change how you look at the world. Let's bridge cultures, transcend borders, and build a global family of change makers. Welcome to If By Chance. Eden is a multi-talented individual who met her now husband on Facebook when he was looking for a singer for his heavy metal band. But before she would agree to a first date, he had to agree to leave Israel and make a life overseas. They chose to make a life in Germany, where Eden helps others create a new life too. And for context, this conversation was recorded before October 7, 2023. We have a band. It's a combination of swing and metal, if you can imagine that. It's not very common. It's pretty new. And why swing and metal? Oh, (laughs) well, it started with metal because he's coming from the metal background and I'm as well. But uh, he had a metal band, like a proper metal band. And he came to me and he was like, you know what? I have this urge to do something new. And he then shared with me three ideas and swing metal was one of them. And I told him like, how about we just make it a kind of like a couple's activity, nothing too serious. And we had so much fun and we really loved the first song that that came up that we were like, cannot stay on our computer. Let's make something out of it. And that's how it started, let's say. (laughs) Yeah, we really like working together. So, Oh, that's something. That's helpful. (laughs) (laughs) Super helpful. And where in the world are you? So I'm currently in Leipzig, Germany. I'm originally from Israel. I was born in Jerusalem. Yeah, I live here six years almost. November, it will be six years. Okay. (laughs) And what brought you there? Oh, well, basically, it's for us, it was very hard living in, in Israel. Mostly economically, it's really expensive to live there. It's getting more and more expensive living there. But this is something that I had in mind for when I was like, I think, 17 years old. Uh, There was already some, uh, not propaganda, like uh, protesting against the pricing and how everything is going. And since then, I had this awareness of like, hey, people are actually moving out sometimes. And when I met my husband the first time or when we had the first talk before our first date, I told them that if we want to go into first date, we first have to have the understanding that, that he needs to be willing to move away from Israel. And he agreed. So <laughs> we started our first date. And specifically Germany, because I also have a EU citizenship, I have a Romanian citizenship, so it's making it easier. Mm-hmm. And Germany always appealed to me. I heard a lot of good things about it. The salaries were higher than in Israel and the expenses were lower. So it could help us save some money even. And Leipzig in particular, that was an accident. <laughs> we, we learned German on YouTube. And, and like one of the ways we've learned German. And on one of the channels, he had a video of why do people move to Leipzig? That's the first time we ever encountered the city. And he said a lot about how it's still affordable. And there's a lot of like a big music scene. And how it's like very vibrant. A lot of young people are moving in and there, there is an international community. A, a lot of days of sun. That was very important for Israelis in particular. So we were like, okay, let's, let's do this. We moved in without even seeing Leipzig for the first time. That, like, the relocation date was our first encounter with Leipzig. So kind of either courageous or a stupid move. I don't know. <laughs> but it worked out <laughs> eventually. So did you have someone to help you relocate? Nope. Um, I was very much keen on going to every website I could find, every Facebook group, every person I could find to interview completely like hours on hours to just take all the information that I need and really gathered everything so that I 100% sure that everything I do is in the right order and makes sense and needs to happen and so on. So I was, I I don't know why I was so crazy about like detail, detail, let's get all the information, but that was really helpful. But other than that, we were just actively looking for people who already live in Leipzig or have lived in Leipzig before, either Israelis or non-Israelis, and just ask them every question we had. 
Yeah, but we decided to relocate in February and we relocated in November. So we had like more than half a year to prepare everything. For a lot of people, that wouldn't be seen as a long time. (laughs) Well, it's uh, true, but since I am already handling a lot of clients who are doing relocation, I've seen already people who are like, yeah, maybe in two, three months, I'm going to relocate without having everything in consideration within. So some people are just like, you know what, how about I jump on a plane? And some people are like, let's do it a year and a half ago uh, before. So we're kind of in the middle, (laughs) probably. So if I've got this right, you relocated and now you help other people relocate. Right. Last year, October, I opened my relocation agency in Leipzig. So now I help those who want to relocate and speak English or Hebrew and don't speak German, probably. Yeah, to navigate this whole bureaucracy process and finding an apartment, you know, having help with the the German language and so on. Because I know how difficult it is and how much you have to deep dive in because there is no one website with everything, with all the information. And also it's constantly changing. There was a lot of change after COVID. So like, there's a lot of things you have to keep being updated about when you're doing the relocation process. And uh, just like I found myself looking for other people and interviewing them for hours, I was doing that myself for free during COVID. Hours and hours of conversations that I've had with random people on Facebook, just helping them with every question they had because I already had the information. I had so much fun doing that. I said, okay, I want to have this as my profession. It can be really a huge variety of people. This is what I love about this. You don't know who's going to come up next and what kind of challenge are they going to face. And then it makes you always kind of being forced to learn and to progress with it. So I love it. This is my my favorite part. (laughs) And do these people have jobs or they just love the idea of living in Germany? So some people were like me and my husband. We were like, we want to relocate no matter how. And we didn't have a job when we came here. We also uh, came on a visa that does not allow you to work for more than half a year. Then uh, we took half a year to just study German. But some people are relocating with a job already or they are freelancers or, as I mentioned, pensioners and they don't need it. So it's not necessarily that you need a job in order to relocate. Uh, Sometimes you just need a change. Sometimes you just have an opportunity that is not related to jobs, like having a a partner in the other country or something like that. And then you later on find your job. And this is also sometimes a very good opportunity to kind of rethink what you're doing and like maybe find something else that you like to do. Same as me, I never did relocation before. (laughs) So yeah, it was cool exploration to do. So has your lifestyle changed much living in Israel versus living in Germany? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) First of all, I would say that the amount of noise and stress that exists like in the environment completely sank down. Leipzig is very, very calm. And a lot of people that come here first time uh, after being in Israel or being in a, let's say, even Berlin or even like, you know, very noisy city or country, they're like, where is everyone? (laughs) Um, it, it is a major change and we chose to live in a place that is not like in the city center a bit far, further away 10 minutes by train it's not like completely insane but it's still like extremely different when the amount of noise and with the amount of like greenery so this is also a big change when it comes to Israel and Germany so in Israel you don't have that much green that you see you have sometimes the desert I lived right next to the desert but I really love this, like trees and parks and lakes that you have everywhere. So this would be very much different. And I think in general, like my, my, my option of choosing maybe more expensive product or items that I want to have for myself is kind of a very big change that I'm very happy that I get to do. I remember specifically that when we came here, the first thing that I was super happy to buy and like not to afraid to buy anymore was smoked salmon. (laughs) I really, really love smoked salmon. And in Israel, it's really, I think, twice the price. And that was a particular moment where I was like, wow, I can really like spoil myself and not feel bad about it. Now I'm already six years in Germany. So I think it already is incorporated in my life too, too long 
for me to notice it even, you know, if you would ask me when I was like one year here, probably I would have a lot more of examples. I would not ride my bicycle for like every place here in Leipzig, for example. It's a very flat city and everybody here rides bicycles to everywhere, even in the snow, which I don't do. But this is a, <laughs> yeah, this is what they, uh, it's also a, a big change in my life, I would say. So then do they have a lot of those fat tire bikes? Ah, uh, no, no, it's not like super fat, but it's like, I think it's more courage than like actual equipment. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think they are so used to being in the snow and doing everything in like cold weather but that I don't. I mean, in Jerusalem, we had snow maybe uh, once in 10 years and nobody is going to ride bicycles in Jerusalem. It's like a very mountainy city. But yeah, I, I probably some of them have the, the right equipment and gear for it, but I still don't get it. I don't think this is the it, like, that the tires is what's going to make me change my decision about it. <laughs> and how have you found making friends mm. in Germany? That is a very good question. A lot of people ask me that because I don't know how much you know about the stereotype about Germans and how easy or not easy to get along with them as friends. They are not the easiest. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's kind of like there is no scale of friendship. It's either they are acquaintance with you or they're your best friends. Like you can have Germans that are doing everything for you and really, really super supportive of you. And they, yeah, but you have to kind of find this barrier and break it. <laughs> um, other than uh, otherwise, you just stay in like this uh, acquaintance area of friends from work, meeting only when there is a possibility or there is a reason to meet and then like everyone to his own. This is kind of the stereotype. I would say a lot of it is true, but a lot of it is changing. I also have some friends who are different in, in, in mindset. But when I came here, I had this, this kind of a, a mission to have German friends. And then I discovered this kind of a stereotype of what I've mentioned already. And then I realized that it's actually easier to start with expats or Israelis within the, the city. And then you have a friend of a friend or you have a party and you meet somebody. And that is kind of easier because, first of all, you are 100% sure this guy or girl speaks English <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because they're among people who speak English. And, and also, like, there is this reason of talking. And then you continue to see them with another party or with another gathering and so on. And then you get a chance to get to know them more. But for example, we have our band and already three of the members are German and it's me and my husband who are Israelis. And for us, it was, all, it was also a little bit hard with the start with some of them because you're like, I'm not sure what they're thinking. I'm not sure if they're saying everything that they had on their mind. And we are in Isra as Israelis, like very loud and very vocal about what we think, what we feel. And this is where it's kind of hard. But when I give uh, tips about how to find friends in, let's say, in a foreign country or in a new location that you're at, I'm very advocate of going into events. The smaller the event, the better, or let's say the more moderated of an event, the better. So it's not like a networking of like, hi, let's gather and just be. But rather there is maybe an activity or maybe there is something that is happening. We are also having some community events with, with the company. And the last event was like a picnic, expat picnic, and I prepared two activities for them to get to know each other. Because I've seen that like if you don't do that, they just start a talk each in his own place and they stay stuck there for two hours. And sometimes they're missing the opportunity to speak with others and they don't know the others just because of that. So I had these two activities and it was very successful and everybody were really happy about it. And so these kinds of, of events that are maybe uh, topic specific, maybe moderated and having activity and something to do with it, and maybe not that big with like hundreds and hundreds of people. I'm also the organizer of female entrepreneurs in Leipzig. So we are also doing events that are especially for females, especially who have the entrepreneurial spirit, not necessarily who already opened a, a business. So this is also one of the opportunities, let's say. So with your relocation business, is this something that comes as part of the package or something you've added on later just because you think it, it helps people flourish in a new environment? So 
this is something that I've seen when I help people for free before, before my business is that they would be kind of understanding of Leipzig is an amazing city. How about I come and visit? They visited or they even did the relocation. And then they were like, well, I can't find friends. I'm leaving. Or I can't have anything to do. Then I'm leaving. I don't know what to do. I'm leaving. And this is where kind of like my, the, the understanding fell down and said, okay. And I said, it, it's not enough. It's never enough when you're finishing with all the bureaucracy part of relocation, because then you have to live. Like, yeah, you have a job, maybe you have like your children have schools and you have your apartment. But then what? Like if you really want to integrate well and to feel like you are part of where you are now relocated to, you have to have friends, especially when you don't have your family next to you. Then you don't have who to to contact when there is an issue or you need help. So I I even tell my clients that this is it should be on their um, goals list like really find friends it's important or at least be in social gatherings just because you also if they are relocating in the winter that can lead to depression especially if you're coming from a warm country like we did it can lead to depression if you don't have friends and you don't have place to go out to so yeah that's just from my understanding of how it should look like i'm sitting here listening to you talk about what it's like to move to another country and it completely makes sense and yet I don't know if a relocation specialist is a different type of job title to an immigration consultant but it just sounds like you're so focused on making sure that when somebody moves they start creating a happy life as opposed to an immigration consultant which is just about checking boxes and making sure you get the visa and you land in the country. Are those two types of jobs or you've just decided it needs to be done differently? To be honest, I'm not, I I never knew that there are two different, you know, professions that called, that could be similar, but I think just from the titles of them, when I am consulting, I never give only one uh, aspect of relocation because yes, bureaucracy is super important, especially when like your first steps in. Even before you're coming, you have things to handle before in your home country. Um, But for me, I am thinking about the whole process. I'm first asking, like, what's your goals? Are you planning on staying for a long time? Maybe it's only for one or two years. And then the consulting also going to look different, not only from a bureaucracy perspective. And so, yeah, for me, it's kind of like a, a whole package, a whole view of people's life within a new country. So I, I can imagine how my consulting look a bit different because it's not focusing solely on bureaucracy, for sure. It's also some hacks, you know, some like tips and like things that I've found out just before being here and nobody talked about before. And this is very important sometimes. And this is like the things that you, if you didn't, if you didn't know before, could save you a lot of time and, and, and a, lot, a lot of frustration sometimes. So yeah. And I think you having done it yourself to the place where you're helping people get to, it, it's totally different than may, maybe me becoming a relocation specialist to Australia because I, I don't I, have that I, I think aim. so the same. Yeah. This is like when people ask me like, okay, but you do have some competitors in Leipzig. Like there are other relocation agencies in Leipzig. What's different? And I'm telling them most of them are actually Germans and they maybe don't know the feeling of being an expat, of being an expat in Leipzig, you know, and uh, even knowing English is not enough in Leipzig. And this is something that a lot of people are super um, shocked about. A lot of people think, oh, Germans know English for sure, 100%. They can all speak English and there is no reason to learn German even. It's like completely not true. Or how does it feel like to be alone in November when, or in December when you came from Israel or from a very hot, hot country? It's like there was those nuances that a local would probably not un- understand unless they did a an, an, um, relocation themselves for a while to another country and came back. Yeah. And, and how have you found starting the business in Germany? I don't know if you did anything similar in Israel, but can you speak to those differences? Absolutely. Yeah, no, this is, it was a challenge of its own. First of all, bureaucracy in Germany in general, it's a very, it's a hard thing because everything is still in paper. 
and still with letters and fax machines. Yes. Yes, I'm now breaking a lot of myths. <laughs> I have here just like some letter from the pension, like the local pension plan. It's like a lot of like text in German that I have to fill out, which I could definitely do online. But yeah. So when you have all these letters that are coming in with like a lot of text in a lot of German and like very high German and like just the governmental vocabulary, it's not the easiest thing to handle. I participated in two programs. One was in English, one was in German. So I had enough sufficient German for that. And this is basically a, a course of how to open a business in Germany. One of them was focused on expats that needs to learn like the what kind of businesses can you open, how to handle employees and so on and so forth. And the other one was for female entrepreneurs. So it was more like how to find your idea, how to be secure enough to even open a business because it's a different approach. And by the end of the second course, which was the female entrepreneurs one, is when I decided, okay, I am opening my relocation agency. This was the business and they kind of led me to that. I would definitely say that I, it would have been much, much, much harder without these two courses. So when relocating and thinking about being an entrepreneur in the, in the new country, look for these kinds of projects for encouraging new entrepreneurs or expat entrepreneurs or female entrepreneurs or, you know, these kind of groups that can give you some insights that you wouldn't find online that easily. I had also some uh, 10 one-on-one -on -one sessions with the person who helped me fill out the files and to understand how it's going to work and so on. So this was a major help. But if I would have done that in Israel, probably it would have been easier from a language perspective, from online options perspective, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Yeah, it wasn't easy. I cannot say it's easy. But that's why we have the female entrepreneurs community, because then you have, after you're done with all those courses, you have those friends and support system for you to still have these like, oh my God, I just got this huge text letter and I don't know what to do with it and so on. And then you have people who support you. So a lot Which of, a yeah, <laughs> a lot of tools. And what's your husband's experience been like? Is he working in a job or a business or? Yeah, he is now in a job as an IT specialist. So is he working for a German company? Actually, no, he's working now for an uh, American company but they have offices in Germany. But he works in Hebrew, German, and English, like with helping clients uh, of the company. But before we did work in, the, in a German company, but in English. Finding the courage to work completely in German, I am really taking my head off to those who or immediately start. Yeah. Um, so I often get asked in terms of IT, how do you go about finding a remote job? Can you Ooh. tell me about yeah, your husband's experience for that. Ooh, well, at the moment, it's very, very difficult in general in IT to find a job. Yeah, the market is suffering a lot, I think, for the last year or half a year. And for him, it was also very difficult to find a job. But at least in Germany, you have LinkedIn and you have Indeed and you have Xing, which is kind of like the German LinkedIn-ish. Mm -hmm. And these kind of tools can help you find, because they have a section of filtering home office, which is after COVID kind of new, I would say. So this is an option. But if you want to do it in English, as I mentioned before, not really the easiest to find since this is, it's kind of a myth that English can lead you everywhere in Germany. And a lot of people, a lot of companies are looking also for Germans or like for German speaking, let's say. and. It's hard, but not impossible. I would go about that. Facebook groups, those websites I've mentioned, talking to people and just tell them, hey, I'm looking for a job. Maybe do you know somebody? Because those kind of connections is eventually what's helping the most. There is a higher chance of being hired if you are referred by a friend, then actually nobody knows you in the, in the company. This is also how he got his job, <laughs> his current job by a friend. So find friends. If we're talking about like the progress, and, like, the progress, find friends first and then a job. <laughs> it sounds comfortable. So do you guys play geeks? Oh, not yet. Not yet. We started the band kind of when I started my business last year. So yeah, it's all started together. And this is 
next year we're planning already on, on having some gigs, but we are also s- still looking for some band members to fill out in the band. So we have a saxophone player, we have a, a drummer, and we have a bass player. And now we're needing a keyboard player. So also. is it the saxophone that makes the swing element? It's the saxophone and also with the keyboard, it's a little bit of like an orchestra-ish behind it and some trumpet, some trombone, some kind of a... And also the beat is very kind of lifting and not in particular so dark and heavy, but the drums and the guitar is what brings it and the bass is what brings it kind of like the heaviness of the metal. So a lot of people listen to this who would never listen to metal, like the mainstream metal and be super happy to listen to it. But still, like now they can say I'm listening to metal (laughs) and I'm not growling. So this is for those who are super scared about metal with growling. There is no growling in in our songs. (laughs) So did you sing metal before? No, actually, no. (laughs) But when me and my husband connected for the first time, it was on Facebook. uh, He was he was with his band and I told him that I'm singing. And he's like, oh, my God, we're looking for a singer. (laughs) But for their metal, it was not fitting because they would need like a heavy growling and like bass vocal that I don't have, if you can hear from my voice. (laughs) What we did do before was we wrote children's songs and I was singing. So with my high pitch, that actually fits, but um, that didn't go for that long. (laughs) We discovered there is like a huge competition in this area. So we moved on to swing metal. (laughs) <laughs> I'm wondering about your upbringing mm-hmm. in terms of you are quite happy to explore the world and try new things and throw yourselves into uncomfortable situations, meet new people. Is there anything that you can think of that's made you more open to that? Um, first of all, I would say that since I was very, very, very young, my parents already observed that I am a very independent person. I want to be by myself. I want to be responsible for myself. I want to try new things. I want to decide for myself. They would struggle with this, you know, because I would be like, no, 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 no. I want to do it myself. So this is part of it. The other part is I think me being very much of an extrovert and I love to talk with people. This is if I wouldn't talk with people, I would not do it as my job. So this is like really a part of me. But I would say I was encouraged to explore new things. And we were also not always in the same house. So we did moved around and I was very happy every time we moved around. It was okay, a new adventure, a new thing to explore. And this is also part of my characteristic, this trying new things all the time. This is also something that if you are an entrepreneur, you cannot be one who is afraid of change. And it's not new. And it's something that it's repetitive for me. It's becoming a a hustle for me. It's becoming something that is taking energy out of myself. I'm learning this. And it's always a a journey to learn about yourself and how you work. And I'm super interested in like self-development and everything in that realm. So in that case, this is something that I've learned that I suffer when I have to do this kind of board meetings of like what do we have to do what are the tasks I have two questions right one is I would have thought that the relocation type business had a lot of steps that needed to be carried out in order and a lot of admin right it really seemed to may not fit with your personality and number two do you find that the people that are relocating are already quite a bit like you or you feel like you're helping them along the way? Huh. Why? I love this question. So uh, for the first one, it does and it doesn't. The thing is, what, let's say, helps me help others is also my tendency to teach. I was a teacher before. I was a chemistry teacher in Israel. So I do hold on to the information and the knowledge, and I give it always in a different way. So for me, every consulting meeting would be different completely than the other in terms of how I would explain something. So the process is the same process, right? The chemistry is the same chemistry. But every time, depending on the person I'm talking with, it would look different. So for them, I would make it 
I would make it look more understandable because for them, everything is in a complete chaos. I already know the next tasks. So it's like the process of taking it from my mind and put it on a paper or like on a, an online platform, whatnot. This is what's painful in a sense. But when it's communicative and talk and like in a, in a conversation, like what we do, I can do it all day, all day. And sharing the knowledge that I gathered and ha making some sense out of processes. And for your second question, yes and a no. So in a sense of some people are very much like me, love the adventure, love the changing new sceneries and finding better opportunities for themselves. And they are communicative ex uh, um, extroverts and so on. Absolutely. But there are people who are relocating because they have to. The situation in Israel <clears throat> politically is getting very much out of hand. And a lot of people are very much frustrated out of the situation. So because of the, let's say, the this year's governmental decisions, I got a lot of requests of, from Israelis. So it's those people who, when I spoke with them five or six years ago about relocating, they would be like, never. So in that case, they even need more help because the change for them is psychologically harder. Um, there is something you have to understand about Israelis when it comes to relocation for the community, when people are coming, are going out of the country, it's kind of considered as being a traitor. So you're, you're leaving us. You are leaving us in the battle kind of situation. It's a very much of an army country and, you know, a, the Jewish community who always suffered and always had to stick together and so on. And even with the terminology in Hebrew, when you say going out of the country, it is to go down from the country translated actually so this whole perspective of leaving the country is very difficult for a lot of people and this is why i'm saying there are some of them who are like yeah i just want to have a new experience and some of them are like i'm su i've suffered enough from whatever it is that happened and i really want to change <laughs> and what advice do you give them like if you were to tell someone coming from a country where they are struggling and they they need to relocate, what two or three things would you say? Okay, so I would first say it really depends on the, their situation. So, for example, there was this uh, couple that I spoke with, or I spoke with the wife on the phone, and she was like, seriously, I am having so much issues and so on, and, like, the issues are causing me to fight with my husband constantly. And I don't know if I love him anymore. I really became, like, an... <laughs> a, a marriage consultant at some point. And I told her, you know, if, you, if you're relocating with someone, for example, and you have a hard time working with the person when you're in your safe zone, this whole relocation process is going to be very much difficult to you. It will make it even harder because this process, it takes a while for that to be comfortable. So I would say the understanding has to happen is that you have to build yourself kind of a safety net that you can relocate with. If, is it financially? Is it psychologically? Is it like with the other persons around you that are coming with you? If it's from having this other person that helps you relocate, this building of the safety net can help you with the success of this uh, process. Not a guarantee, but it's helping. Another thing is to come very much flexible in mind. So a lot, uh, some people are like, yes, I want to change, but then they want to create the same exact thing they had in the other country in uh, the new country. So that can happen, but it never is on the first trial. So it's never on the first month you get the same apartment, the same size, uh, I don't know, um, ground floor with a garden and apple trees. Okay, it's never that easy. So you have to start flexible and grow into where you want to be in the end of this, is this journey. May it be the same thing or something completely different, doesn't matter, but first be flexible. So you have to kind of be more willing to compromise on what you start with and then later on find something that you want to settle into. And the last thing is the more prepared you come, the better. So I understand there is a rush to change. I understand there is an urge to go out of the country. 
But if you can give it some months just to make sure that you're doing everything correctly and not like the hell with everything, this is going to make everything much more easy. So if you're leaving a bank account behind open and then if you want to close your bank account, it, maybe you have to actually physically be there. So these kind of small things that you have to make sure you do before, I would really take the time to understand. And if you can learn the language before, much better. Not a huge, let's say, not a huge factor of if you would manage this process, but can definitely make a difference. Fantastic advice. <laughs> and hear, hearing yourself speak about those points, it strikes me it's great advice as an entrepreneur as well. That's true. That's true. When you're, when you're starting out and trying any new idea and just having this understanding that there's a zone of discomfort and we're going to need to be okay to sit within that and that sometimes we don't know how long that's going to last. Very true. And I have this experience of coming up with like ideas for businesses and not really thinking through the whole thing. So it's just like, hey, I have a great solution and maybe I should try it and starting to do it and then realizing this is not something maybe I'm passionate about or this is not something that if nobody is going to pay me for half a year, I'm still going to do. So there yeah. are like those concepts that you have to first understand when you're starting a business before even going for it. But your first point about a safety net covers off on that because sometimes when we're starting out on something new, we can't possibly know everything. And sometimes we're going to run into something that completely takes us by surprise. Right. But if we haven't gone all in and we have that safety net, we're going to be okay. True. True. But there are people, I, I am, I know really people who are like, the hell with everything. I'm going to start. Both situation, being an entrepreneur and doing relocation. And I had, I helped one, one guy who I even almost gave, uh, found him an apartment right next door to me. Like really like it, you, he cannot be closer. Right. And it, after one week, he came back to his home country. One week. It's not even like one month. No, one week because he was scared out of his mind. He didn't know what ha what's happening. Oh my God, the German language. And then it like was super overwhelming. But it's like the same urge that I said before, like, okay, I want to change something or I want to have a better life and so on. Sometimes the imagination of how the future is going to look like is really not fitting reality. And then it hits you so hard that you go back and you, you quit. So I would say also, and this is also another tip that I would say in general, no matter if the, they are prepared enough or not prepared enough, there is always the reality versus the imaginary situation. And this is why I also done a webinar solely on myths about Germany. And I think there were like almost 20 myths <laughs> that uh, people are not aware of because whatever you hear about Germany is probably from the news or probably from, I don't know, something that is TV or something. I don't know. Those misconceptions can then sometimes really be a shock to people. Just like I mentioned with the fax machine and with the letter situation it's very much here and existing and you would see a lot of websites in Ge um, german websites and you'll be like are we in the 2000s like what's happening why is it so old looking but this is kind of the german mentality if it's not broken let's not fix it kind of situation so it, it, it can be a shock to people definitely do you still have that webinar no, no, it was live. I will definitely do it again. <laughs> it was very much a success, I would say. But yeah, I'm covering a lot of different aspects of relocation. <laughs> Sounds like it. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And I'm sorry we can't link to the 20 myths, but I would definitely love to put a link in the show notes for the swing metal. <laughs> I will definitely send you our swing metal band. <laughs> I also really, really much enjoyed this conversation. It was very much of a pleasure. We can never be sure of what life will throw at us. All we can do is make the most of what we have today. So lean into what infuses you with energy. Create a safety net where you can and hug those who bring joy to your life. 
Links to connect with Eden and listen to some swing metal can be found in the show notes. Now, dear listener, it's your turn. Have you got something to add to the conversation? Then get in touch via the links in the show notes. Whether you have questions, a message of support, or resources that you think might help, we'd love to hear from you. And if by chance, you know someone with a story that will inspire others, be sure to let us know. Your contributions help turn inspiration into action, drive positive change and make life just that little bit better. And if this conversation inspired you to expand your worldview, head to hellohuman.global to join the conversation.